Welcome to the Oral History of Criminology. We are here in New Orleans at the meetings of the Academy of Criminal Justice Sciences. Uh, we're interviewing Dr. Frank Hagen, who has had a long and distinguished career uh, in, in the field, a prolific uh, author and researcher, and uh, we hope to find some uh, insights today into his life and, and, and his work. Uh, Frank has uh, You've had a very interesting background, getting uh, degrees from th three different universities, writing eight books, uh, a number of them in multiple editions, which we're going to get to. Um, but let's, if we could, just start at the beginning. Uh, you were born and raised outside Pittsburgh. Inside, downtown. Oh, you were in Pittsburgh? Yeah. yeah. Okay, downtown. And, Northside. And, and what was it like growing up there? Well, I grew up in the old uh, Irish neighborhood. Uh, most of these people were Irish immigrants or second, third generation. Okay. And uh, I lived in a 60-family uh, apartment building there. It was okay. called The Ward. The, the neighborhood was called The Ward. Uh -huh. And uh, some of my uh, neighbors, uh, I grew up with Mike Hayden, who's the head of the CIA and the NSA. And also down the street was Art Rooney, who owned the Steelers. Oh, wow. And they tore down our whole neighborhood to build all the stadiums. <laughs> so I feel right at home when I'm down there. You're standing in a parking lot during a tailgate saying, this is where I used to live. <laughs> oh, that is great. So that is that is right in the city itself, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and, and what kind of child, childhood did you have? Oh, I liked it. I mean, yeah. you, you were almost too dumb to know how poor you were. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I remember one time in grade school, uh, somebody was talking about Howard Johnson's, and I said, who's he? You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'd never been out to the central city. You you know? Right, you didn't yeah. even know what it was. Yeah. Yeah. But it was fun. I mean, it was, uh, you always felt like you were in the center of things. If there was something coming into town, you could sneak into whatever they had, their stadium and things like that, but to yeah. see everything. You know? I got you. I'd be called delinquent today, you know, or whatever. Right. <laughs> Okay, and and in, in your in, in that time you were growing up, was it common for for folks in the neighborhood to go to college? No, I, I was the first one in my of all my relatives to go to college. I mean, since then a lot have gone. Yeah, but, uh, and no, it wasn't. Even though we're right near all, I mean, I could walk to Duquesne University, Pitt. I mean, they were all right there. Yeah, and uh, the city was real jammed, you know, like with the right. hills and stuff. You know, yeah. But I, I you know, I enjoyed it. I mean, I think. It gave you a sense of, uh, well, almost like a, in New York City or something. Right. You know, entitlement, you know what was going on. And right. So you ended up uh, going to uh, your undergraduate work again in university uh -huh. up in uh, Erie, PA. That's about, what, two hours north? Yeah, about that, yeah. And, uh, and how did you end up there? Well, um, I just, uh, actually I had a, a, prof or a teacher and I uh, went to North Catholic High School and really admired him and a whole bunch of us went up, up there to school. We thought. It was cool, and I actually, in, in in retrospect, it was great to I had to lose my Pittsburgh accent, things like this. You know, it's like the kid from Brooklyn, you know. Right, right. They're not going to take you as seriously, or something. I still have some of it, but I mean, I I, I think that helped me a lot, and it was nice going away to school too. Okay, and now uh, uh, was uh, Dan Koenig on the faculty there? Yes, he was, and uh, Koenig, yeah. He, uh, as you know, uh, if you were talking about influences on my life, he was one of the biggest. And he was on the faculty. He was a young guy. He was about a year or two older than me at the time, yeah. teaching us. And uh, he taught for many years at the University of Victoria, British Columbia. Mm -hmm. And uh, he died, unfortunately, not yeah. too long ago, of cancer. Oh, really? Yeah. But he was a he was a, a wonderful man, a very uh, influential man. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I recall yeah. him being at a few of our meetings here. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. No, an interesting guy. Okay, and then a big jump occurred when you get your bachelor's degree and you decide to go to, to the University of Maryland, mm -hmm. uh, which is you know a long way from Pittsburgh. Yeah, so well, that's how did you think? I mean, yeah. That, yeah. And so, how, how did that happen? Well, you know, I think in many of these things, I would almost get a compass and just draw a big circle from Pittsburgh. And my wife's from Erie, so you know, okay. you almost have two circles, and that's where I like to go, you know. And mm -hmm. so that's kind of the way I hit uh, Maryland, and that seemed exotic. I was getting out of the northeast, it's still the northeast, yeah. but you know, it's near D.C. and right, uh, right. I was glad I went to Maryland, I really enjoyed it, and, uh, and doing research there and everything. Right, and uh, your master's thesis, was it, where you did it on the town of Columbia, Maryland? Yeah, which, which I enjoyed. one of the original planned communities. Yeah, I really enjoyed that. Uh, I, I, I think uh, part, uh, part of my area is research methods, and a lot of it was dumbing your way into some of these things. I yeah. thought, boy, that'd be cool, the largest new town ever built from scratch in the, in the country. And, uh, and I talked with, I had got a mentor, and I said, I'd like to do that. And I had no idea what I was going to do. I, I started off with participant observation, mm -hmm. and uh, 
the town was hardly built. Uh, there weren't that many people living there, and their headquarters was in Baltimore. So I used to commute to Baltimore, and they were real nice to me. But let me tell you how I ended up uh, with an office and doing all this research in Baltimore. I saw my advisor, and I said, here's an ad in their newspaper, Columbia Times or something, that they're going to have the informal discussion group. And uh, do you think I should go to that? And he says, oh, yeah, it's a newspaper. You know? So I went up to this thing. And uh, we teach people today that you get permission for things. Yeah. I had no idea. I was 21 years old sitting in a lobby. Residents are coming in, going into another room or something like that. And so I went in there too. And you're all complaining. Every one of them said that uh, I was interviewed last week by Time Magazine. I was interviewed by the New York Times. They couldn't get out of their, their homes on the weekends and stuff. And I was so damn, I didn't ask anybody's permission. I'm sitting there and finally somebody says, I haven't heard a thing from that guy over there. I would gulp. <laughs> and I, you know, I explained what I was doing, and a few of them said, you know, good luck, kid. They knew I was harmless. And some others, what's your name? And oh, right. All that, yeah. So I went to the university the next morning, and every student that I knew was saying, did you see Dr. Jane Jack? They are, people are hunting for you. And yeah, and one of their developers or whatever, he came down to the university, and he saw my advice. What, if I, what was that guy doing up there? Are you spying on us? I don't think he had spies up there. That's what they said. You know? Oh, wow. So I, I said, no, they probably just looking at me knew I wasn't oh, yeah. <laughs> capable. But um, they, uh, fortunately, they said they'll be glad to cooperate with me, but they don't want any more participant observation. The, the residents, you know, okay. wouldn't like that. So I was up in Baltimore then. They says, here, you know, you can have this office. You can have access to anything you want. You can interview. James Rouse was a developer then. He's the guy that uh, you would know. Mm -hmm. He did the inner city Baltimore uh, uh -huh. redevelopment. He did the, the river walk here in New Orleans. Oh, did he? Oh, yeah. You named some really, you know, spazzy type of uh, uh, development, and, and he was behind it. And he had real, a real visionary type of guy. He did, he did stuff that you know, he would like, okay, I'm going to build this, but I would like it for all races. All social classes. I mean, you know, rather than just another suburb, you know, upper right. middle class commuting in and all that. And so he was really a visionary type of a guy. But at any rate, I mean, that really got me. I thought my thesis was done. You know, <laughs> see you later. But uh, you know, that that worked out very well. And I didn't know what to do with it. But I realized at the time it was probably the first study right. done on that place. Yeah. No, it, it, it really was a remarkable thing. Uh, you know, basically trying to create a new community from scratch. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, and plan it out. We argued. He said it's just going to be a real community, not just another suburb, yeah. because it's easy in D.C. and Baltimore. They're about thirty-four miles apart or something like yeah. that. Do anything and you it sell. Yeah. But uh, a lot of people really appreciated the, the community. Now, I've unfortunately, not done much with that at all since then. So right. Sure. Maybe sometime I'll get the foundation to. Sponsor me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, and, and then an important thing happened. You decided at one point to go on for your PhD. Uh -huh. uh, what 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 contributed to that decision? Well, I I could have just stayed on. We had some deaths in the family and reasons to get back into Western Pennsylvania, and I was teaching at Slippery Rock University. That was one of my stops. Yeah, and and which, which which is located between Pittsburgh and right. Area. And I'm glad I did that. That gave they're not going to give me my dissertation and my PhD when I was probably about 23 I think you yeah. know so I got a chance to be seasoned a little bit you know yeah. and, and get some experience and I think it was invaluable to get that experience yeah. it really helped I went to Case Western Reserve in Cleveland uh, initially commuting and then later they offered me a job over there and I could finish my dissertation and that's when I moved into Collinwood section of Cleveland uh, you know all the stories. Yeah, and uh, and and that that is interesting because when you look at your uh, career, and we're going to get we're we're getting there, um, uh, but but uh, before we get into your written work, you did have spent most of your career at Mercyhurst University in Erie. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You were there. I don't know how many years. A lot of years. A lot of years. <laughs> uh, so the question is, uh, why there, and why did you stay? Given the fact that you know. Uh, over those years, you were becoming, you know, very well known, and you, oh, you could have easily moved. Well, it's my wife's hometown, so that, uh, and I liked it there. I mean, yeah. it's a, believe it or not, like a summer resort area, really, and uh, it's not so great this time of year. You know, <laughs> we have single-digit uh, temperatures and right. 130. We beat the hell out of Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse. 138 inches of snow we have currently, and none of those are anywhere near yeah. that. They're about 20. Or, imagine Buffalo. We beat that. Yeah, no, it it was was amazing. But it's a nice, it's about two hundred thousand metropolitan area, and it's just kind of 
not quaint, but I mean, it's kind of nice, you know. Yeah. And you're real close to Canada, you're real close to Buffalo. We are about uh, the only only uh, city in the country that has three FN three NFL franchises within about an hour and a half drive. Yeah. You know? And uh, and that's another claim to fame. I have I had season tickets to the Steeler games, so that was. That was important. <laughs> that was important on where you're located. Right? Yeah. right, given the fact that you were, you know, born and raised in the shadow of their oh, stadium. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that is good. Yeah, so uh, so that, that that I guess has always been an anchor, an anchor for you. Uh, now, you know, some would say that that you became finishing your PhD at, at Case, uh, sort of a classic criminologist. In other words, the core of any field of study is theory and method. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's sort of so. If you're going to start. A program of any sort, mm -hmm. you have to teach theory, you have to teach method, no, uh, and uh, and those have been two of of your major driving areas mm -hmm. over the over the course of your career. So it's in the uh, early '80s uh, you decide that you're going to write a research methods book. Mm -hmm. uh, what get what uh, got got you to that point where you wanted to do that? Well, I was asked to teach uh, more more and more criminal justice. That's right. Where you, moved in that direction, and uh, they asked me to teach research methods, and I said, well, you know, what books are there? Well, there aren't any. Well, you know, I could use a social one or this or that, but why not, you know, pick up on that and, right. and try to write one? And uh, actually, I think, maybe there may have been one person who beat me to it, but they didn't, nothing ever happened to that, so right. it almost becomes the first one, you know. Right. Uh so yeah, so you're teaching a class and say there's no methods book with examples from criminology. That's exactly it, uh -huh. and, and, and that, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, now, have you now that, that book is in its what tenth edition, so something yes, like that. Yes, it is. That's right. And uh, I mean, in in this field, especially, I mean, that that's incredible legs. There's not many books that make uh -huh. it to ten editions. Uh -huh. uh, how, how do you account for the fact that it's had the staying power, given the fact that now there's a gazillion methods books? And yeah, I don't know. I uh, you know I, I tried to make it. Uh, readable to the student. I mean, they're not going to like research methods anyhow. You know? <laughs> right, yeah. But um, I tried to find interesting examples, uh -huh. and, um, and I still am. I was just asked today, maybe consider an 11th. And I figured, wait a minute here, I'm not sure I wanted to do an 11th. You know? but, yeah, it's a lot. Of it's an awful lot, lot of work, yeah. And then, uh, just really a, a few years later, you decided that you're going to do a theory book, a crim theory book. And uh, it was really criminology. Yeah, you? yeah. And 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 what what uh, you know pushed you to do that? Well, it's almost like your career. I mean, you you, know, you start teaching in these areas, and you develop your own style. You develop your own examples. I mean, one of the examples we'll probably talk about is when I I moved to Cleveland and mm -hmm. lived in a gang neighborhood and stuff mm -hmm. like that that I had, hadn't anticipated. So then it ends up being a research project. You know? <laughs> but uh, you know, you, you kind of like to tell your own stuff, and you realize that what you're lecturing on in class and stuff, these students don't can't read it. They don't have it anywhere. Yeah, right. So it'd be nice to have them, you know, read that chapter and uh -huh. we'll talk about it. Yeah. Know? And and that that book has been through a lot of editions. Is is it's it a tenth tenth, tenth, tenth edition. Yeah. Crim again, which uh, you know for this field is crazy, especially now that there's seems like there's hundreds of criminals. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Which is good. I'm glad which, which is good. But it's good to know that you've written something that, you know, enough people have liked. Yeah. That, you know, uh, I mean from a book that began in the eighties, the fact that it's still out yeah. there yeah. is 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 pretty impressive. Yeah, I think the first edition was eighty six. Like, yeah. Wow, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a long time ago now. Yeah. Uh, so it it is it is uh, uh, amazing. And then over the course of your career, so theory and method have sort of been your yeah. two core areas. Uh, and uh, but then you have uh, other things that sort of branch off of that, uh -huh. and uh, one of them is that you know you've you've written a bit on on organized crime, uh -huh. and uh, matter of fact, one of one one of your uh, original articles is still cited a lot. You went on uh, organized crime to definitions, yeah. uh, and uh, so you know many folks still refer to that article. And that well, we like, revisited that. I mean, I don't know intentionally, but I revisited it with updating a content analysis of definitions of organized crime. Mm -hmm. And you did a very similar one. And right. then uh, one of your mentors, uh, Jim Finkenauer, uh, yeah. did some work on that. Yes, we all did. came up with similar conclusions. Right, really yeah, phenomenal. yeah, it really was, yeah. it was interesting. And, uh, and but your, your connection with organized crime is, is, is not ac accidental. Because uh, uh, you spent, as a, as a, doing your PhD a significant time in mm -hmm. Cleveland, where, where Case Western Reserve is located. Mm -hmm. And uh, so 
to tell me about your uh, exposure to organized crime in Cleveland. Okay, I, we moved there, and, uh, and you know, after commuting, you know, about two hours each way, you know, that got old, and they were very kind to give me a nice job there and everything, and re research job, and, and taught methods there, and, and uh, social, industrial sociology, things such as that. But I remember moving over there, and I was saying to the people, you know, I just moved over here. We got a nice house in a place called Collinwood, this section of Cleveland. Okay. And I see eyebrows going up and everything. And that was where the Irish mob operated out of Collinwood, and mm -hmm. a guy named Danny Green. Very well-known organized crime well, figure in Cleveland. I, he, they killed something like 48 members of the Italian mafia over there, and it was like little Beirut. They were blowing them all up. And they made a movie out of this called Kill the Irishman. Yes, and that just came out like in 2011 or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. And so when we were over there, we didn't know any of this. I wasn't into criminology at all at the time. And uh, after we moved out, my wife says, yeah, read the paper now. And there it is, Danny Green. They blew, Danny Green was blown up himself. He yeah. got even. Yeah, yeah. And of all things, the guy that blows him up. Well, I'm the only criminologist who has lived downstairs of a hitman, because he lived upstairs, but not, not Danny Green. But one of his associates, mm -hmm. and uh, when we moved back to Erie, we lived on the street from the guy that killed him, another hitman. Said, what? What is this? Yeah, people in the neighborhood said, "You know that old guy up there? I think he's a gangster." Yeah, he sure is a gangster. Right. Yeah. But but you were you were fitting right in because all these guys are Irish, right? Yeah. And you're you're Irish. See, the lady upstairs, the landlady, asked uh, this. I'm not going to mention his name because he's out of prison now. Okay. So. <laughs> but, yeah, and uh, <laughs> but. Uh, at any rate, uh, she she talked him into taking us out on a double date, you know, so be nice to us, we're doing town and stuff. So there I am, it's the summertime, my wife and I are in the back seat of this convertible. This convertible, uh, I have relatives that are kind of like this, they, they, the whole convertible is painted, Kelly Green has little flags on it and all this stuff. Yeah, I said, well, I have relatives that do that. And we're riding around the streets of Cleveland and stuff, and here, he has a, a bullseye on the back of his car, kind of bloated there. The mob wants to kill this guy, you know. Yeah. And uh, they finally um, uh, got went out of town and got this Ray Ferrito from Erie to come over and blow him up. And uh, yeah, so you don't even know, you know, like God, what God protects drunks and this and that in the United States. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. It is amazing because at that time period, as you say. Uh, you know the, the you know the, the, the Irish were controlling organized crime at that particular time, and uh, they were very violent. I mean, there was probably more car bombings. Well, who was the one in New York City that, that was real big? The, the Westies. The, the Westies. There's yeah. There's only like about um, ten of them, and they took on them all. Right, uh, but they were extremely violent. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah. which which uh, ultimately did, did them in. Oh yeah. So yeah. So this is good. So you actually lived. Uh, organized crime, <laughs> uh, which is good because then that guy, Rick Perello, in the early 2000s, wrote that book about right. about the, uh, the mafia in Cleveland. Yeah, and it was pretty much, uh, you know, all Irish. He might still have a website, you know, that you can. He, he was like a hobbyist, and he yeah. would keep up websites on all these different groups. Yeah, it, it, it really, it really is fascinating stuff. Now, and a, another uh, interest branching off your interest in in crim. <laughs> Uh, besides organized crime, has has political crime, mm -hmm. uh, political crime including crimes committed by presidents, uh, spies. Uh -huh. uh, there's been a lot of issues. It's like crimes against the state and crimes by the state. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's uh, pretty much it. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, organized crime on one end and the political uh -huh. crime on, on on the other end. And what got you interested in that? I just, I, I just like that stuff, and uh, I I kind of think that we very early on. Uh, gave up some of those topics, the political science and some of these other people. And then, you know, you talk about crime and costly crime, my God, you know, so you're not going to talk about spies, huh? Yeah. Well, you look at what some of these people have stolen, and that's more than all the crimes in 10 years. I mean, why wouldn't you include them? Why are they different? So I, I was attracted to that. I like to, I like to read, like, spy novels and things such as this. You run out of fiction, why not read the nonfiction and see what you can do with it? Right. But yeah. a lot of people jumped into that after 9-11. You know, in the early days, there was nobody really studying this. No, and and the proof of the pudding is, uh, I forget what the year was, you were invited to speak to, to the intelligence community. I knew someone else that was along for that <laughs> and, speech. And uh, it was... <laughs> It was in uh, it was in, in in Virginia. It was the Northern Virginia Intelligence Community. Yeah, the Northern Virginia. That's exactly <laughs> yeah. who it was. And uh, but they were looking for answers because they were having a lot of incidents where oh, yeah. uh, good agents were going bad. People mm -hmm. who were screened well up front were were, were getting mm -hmm. in, into trouble. 
and uh, you know they were looking for people who had you know d done sort of cross actions. cross check their stuff and see yeah. if they're on the right track too. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so it, it is rare. I can't think of too many occasions where where the, the intelligence community turns to an academic. Well, it was funny though because we, we we went down there and uh, there was another fellow with us and. Uh, and the FBI were escorting us around because they said the intelligence community, they were CIA and all different people over there. And uh, the, the FBI guy didn't bring proper credentials. They weren't letting him in. We got in. <laughs> but, uh, but I think I'd like to see a lot more of that. And, yeah. uh, and it's not like they, they know more than we do or we know more than they do. But we're cross-checking it. They can say, you know, we didn't get that angle on it. That, but that's good. Right. You know? And yeah, and what they were looking for is people who had done work like you. When you look at uh, a number of these cases, what seems to be common features and that kind of thing, and they hadn't done that kind of analysis. You know, it's disconcerting now, they'll just, uh, before your presentation now, so we'd like to remind you now that this is all, you know, like they have their own wording for all this stuff. This is all top secret, not, no, not top secret. You're not to develop, divulge that material. Right. Uh, and so this is all open source material, and that's fine, you know. So, and, so, you know, I always felt like you could be doing all this stuff and, and you're making a fool out of yourself because you never read all the secret <laughs> stuff that, you know. Yeah, you don't, you don't know what they know. Yeah, they could have put some guy up to doing this and that to uh, confuse the Russians or the Chinese or mm -hmm. something like that. We, we didn't know that. Yeah, and yeah that, that's true. We yeah. wouldn't know. Uh, but, you know, it was a very, very interesting, interesting experience. Oh, yeah. And then uh, a related uh, area, of course, connected to both political crime and organized crime is white collar crime. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, you, you have done work you know, in, in that area as well. Mm -hmm. And did you see that as a natural branch off of the other two? Oh, I don't know. I don't even know what, which comes first. Yeah. It, it, it's more fun to study you know, smart criminals and, um, and uh, criminals that really cost us a lot of money. I mean, you yeah. could take a given year and I don't know what the, all the bank robberies might be, $100,000. That was a pittance. Yeah, right. And uh, these people were stealing. I think the savings and loan scandal was five hundred billion dollars. Let's start. There's crime. That's every robbery ever since Silver, uh, Plymouth Rock. And I mean it. Uh, and we we weren't really talking about some of those things. No. Yeah, and you were one of the first to sort of to start tying this together you, when you did work uh, on the savings and loan scandal, mm -hmm. uh, which which broke in in uh, uh, in the eighties and nineties. Mm -hmm. The uh, and the interesting part there that there were elements of organized crime and political crime oh, and white yeah. collar crime uh, in all of that. Yeah, when a lot of those people went, they just jumped right in there because the federal government was funding anything. And at the time they had things like heads, I win, tails, it was called FISLIC, Federal Savings and Loan Insurance Corporation. Yeah. FISLIC loses. Right. And the federal government, I mean, it was like F, F uh, what is it, uh, the bank. Uh, FDIC, come, yeah. Yeah, it all came out of the Depression era, mm -hmm. and they didn't want another Depression or anything. But they were funding everything. I mean, they, you know, instead of what they should have done was just closed up all these places as fast as they could. Yeah. Because all that they were getting was about 3% on lo loans for houses, and uh, I forget what they were paying out uh, on other things, 18% or something. That's not a good business model that they were following. Yeah. Right, and, and it was very good you know, to point out that the essence of the whole scheme was corrupt relationships. Oh. And, the, and they are, you know, it was hard to tell who the good guys were, who the oh, bad absolutely. guys were. Oh, yeah. absolutely, yeah. And, uh, and people were getting great rewards for running these savings loans. And as you were saying then, uh, they, uh, the mob uh, you know, got in, involved in some of these, and you know, Charles Keating uh, out mm -hmm. of Ohio was doing a lot of this stuff. And in many cases, when these places went bankrupt, here's the federal government owning houses of prostitution in Nevada. Uh, you know, just corrupt places, and uh, you know. Right, and, and it seems, for me anyway, the, the, the contribution of that work is that, you know, in criminology, uh, even and even within the field, people tend to look at very distinct offenders and distinct victims. Mm -hmm. Somebody doing something bad to somebody else. Yeah. But in uh, cases like these, the savings and loan and related ones, it's very difficult because the people who are the victims are in fact facilitating the crime yeah. because they're profiting yeah. as well. And, and spending money with uh, Congress, you know, backing, yeah. getting people elected, and yeah. yeah. So it's, it's a real disaster. Right. right, it's very difficult to identify, well, who is, who is victimizing, who, who's the victim? Mm -hmm. obviously, obviously it ends up being the public is holding most of the money, yeah. uh, but uh, uh, there hadn't been a lot of work that sort of identified in a very clear way how, how all these types of crimes Yeah, are so like. even if you do a lousy job of it, I mean, it's at least a job of trying to find out these things. I mean, you know, sort of hit their eyes and, you know, let's talk some more about uh, 
uh, teenagers uh, who are delinquent or using drugs or something. And right. That's important. I'm not belittling that, but God, let's talk about, instead about the industry, uh, giving oxycodone out and oxycontin. And, I mean, I don't know how many people have been killed. Was it 64,000 people last year? Yeah, it's you know, pretty amazing. It's just, the heroin looks like the good old days. You know? <laughs> right. It's like, geez. right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I know that yeah, the pills are, are just so, so much more. This is so much more powerful. Now, in um, in your time at uh, Mercyhurst, mm -hmm. and you taught at some other institutions. So you've taught at the bachelor's level, the master's level, mm -hmm. the uh, doctoral, doctoral level. Mm -hmm. uh, you've taught quantitative methods, qualitative methods. You, uh, I mean, it's really amazing. I think by my count, going through your vita, you've taught thirty-five different class preparations over oh, the course. I didn't of even year. know that. That's freaking amazing. <laughs> I mean, uh, thirty-five different classes. Mm -hmm. uh, so my question is, when you do that, and then even at Mercy Harris, you were chair for a while, and you were even dean of graduate studies for a while. Mm -hmm. So given all of that, uh, you know, you have taught a lot. You know, I mean, heavy teaching load, lots of, lots of preps. How did you manage to be a prolific writer, uh, writing, you know, eight books? A couple of them in the tenth edition. Uh, so when you start adding up manuscripts, that's a lot of manuscript. That's almost like one a year over the course of your mm -hmm. career, uh, and uh, you know, one year book manuscripts. Uh, so how were you able to maintain that level of productivity, given the fact that you were teaching all of these classes as well as doing some administration? Well, you know, you just sort of set up the time. You just, you know, I, I would write in the evenings and things like that, and you try to do it every day and. Mm -hmm. um, and as time, to be honest about it, I mean, as time went on, uh, the, de depending upon the administration at the college, you could get deals. You know, I mean, they'd, they'd give you a course offer this or a course offer that. Right. And uh, I'm now retired from there, but before I was, uh, I was down to like three course load. And, uh, and then we got some new people in there, and uh, they just went right back to eight for everybody. You know, and oh, really? Like, oh, yeah, terrible. A four, four, course But that gave you more some leeway. Mm -hmm. It gave you some options and things, right. but you try to write, always try to write, and I'm sure you did the same thing, on things that you're teaching. And so you almost take your class notes as your outline and then fill it in, right. much more sophisticated material. And, you know. Right. And, and did you have a, a rigor with how you do it? You know, have to do a page a day or how you... No, but I would, you know, I would be curious when that's all I did, was just, you know, write your butt off and just see, see how much you can get out. You know? Yeah. I know you... Right early in the morning, I understand, and it's like about three hours every day or something yeah. like that. Uh, but it, but it's hard to do because you have taught more class preparation than I've ever taught, and you have taught I think more courses per semester than the average person who writes in the field. Mm -hmm. uh, because as you know, it's very difficult to have multiple class preps going at once, oh, yeah. and then to do any serious writing during those semesters. Mm -hmm. uh, because you know there's grading, and you got to walk into the classroom and have something to say. And, mm -hmm. uh, so it's very difficult, uh, many people find, during the academic year to do writing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, unless you're doing it late at night or on weekends yeah. or uh, really the, the, the summer for many people is the only time they get to write. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and faculty now complain about a 2-2 two, two load being high. So, yeah. it's, it, you know, the world has changed a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but to maintain your level of writing and writing in long form, these are, we're talking book manuscripts, uh, uh, while you're teaching all those classes is pretty remarkable. Well, I think it helped over the years. You'd, you'd negotiate things and say, no, I'm headed to graduate program. What do I get for that? Two courses off for that. Okay. And then they'd have other types of that School was very generous with uh, uh, time off and um, uh, course loads yeah. uh, if you're doing something. You know, right. It took a while to get them there. <laughs> right. And you know, you can get a new group in and they can change all that overnight. Yeah. Yeah, uh, administrations do mm -hmm. come and yeah. come come and go. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> where they say, "Okay, everybody, you aren't you aren't as productive as, as you want to be." Um, now, during your career, you've won a, a, a number of awards, uh, outstanding teacher, Mercy Hurst, uh, and of course, you you were uh, selected a fellow of the Academy of, of uh, you know Criminal Justice Sciences, um, and uh, so, at what point in your career did you realize that? Oh my God! I'm working hard. I'm doing my stuff, but then the next step is when other people are recognizing that you're doing good work. Yeah, it's very nice. It's yeah. Very, you know, really, um, uh, very kind. I, I, I thought like within uh, the uh, academy, uh, mm -hmm. I was always honored to have like big names, Gil Geis or you know other. I, sh I hate to mention names because you're going to leave somebody out that you should have in there. But uh, 
and, and they know who you are, or they see you, and they come across the hall to talk with you. And I thought, my God, this is wonderful, you know. And so I, that really entices you to try to do more. I mean, right. these people think what you're doing is okay. That's pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty good. When, yeah. Mm -hmm. when, when real, you know, big big shots in the field, yeah. uh, you know, recognize, you know, that you're doing mm -hmm. good work. Yeah. Well, another was like Gerhard Mueller, mm -hmm. you know, out of Rutgers, and I mean, I was honored that he you know, knew you, and you know, and and, and you know, Freya was mm -hmm. his wife, and uh, you know, I was not never one of their students. I remember coming over, and he goes like this, and he puts something on my lapel, uh -huh. and he was doing this for all the Rutgers grads. Right. He put one on mine, and he says, "Well, you're, you know, he, he didn't realize that one. No, you're kind of one of us." You know? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And there are people like that. And people, you know, like Gerhard who who, you know, he, he remembered everybody's names and he was He was absolutely unbelievable. About that. Right. He, he yeah, uh, he was, you know, really, you know, a, a man of the world. Uh, but so when, but when you look at all the things you've written, uh, you know, you've written a lot and uh, and all the teaching you've done, uh, is there anything that stands out to you as being uh, the things that you're most proud of? that you've gotten done? Well, I don't know. I mean, you can go all the way back to just getting to PhD, graduating from college. I mean, you know, a lot of those things are your big deals, you know. Right, yeah. And, uh, and then, as you're saying, like writing a book and then people actually buy it. You know? it's like, <laughs> That's always whoa. amazing. Whoa. <laughs> Somebody other than me has read it. Yeah, yeah. I use it as a doorstop and stuff. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm real proud of those kind of things. You yeah. know, people are validating you. I mean, they actually thought this was okay. Maybe I'm on the right track and, you know. But you might as well do something. You might as well make some contribution back to the field in one way or another. And that's what I'm most proud of, like research methods. And because uh, when I first started into criminology and criminal justice, I mean, research methods, you just got somebody else to teach it. You know, and we pretty well started developing our own statistics, our own research methods, and, uh, and just uh, some of the areas that we're most interested in in terms of organized crime, political crime, white collar crime, and getting some of that stuff uh, published. I mean, Took pride in that. Yeah, well, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, again, two books, both in their, you know, in ten editions is just, is you know, it's just uh, amazing. Um, and uh, and as you look at your your career and all the paths you've taken from you know Maryland, you know, to Case, mm -hmm. to to Mercyhurst, to writing projects that that that, that you've taken on, uh, are there certain th any of those that, that sort of stand out to you that you're the most proud of? Uh, well, I, you know, we're going all the way back to Columbia, Maryland. I yeah. mean, that was kind of, you know, no one was writing about that at the time. And I was lucky. You could see how I, I got in there at all. I was lucky, you know. And sometimes you just sort of fumble into things like that. But uh, uh, I, I really can't think of specific things. Yeah, specific. That, you know. But I'm, I'm just happy to be, to, to do what I'm doing. I mean, to be in criminal justice and, and criminology and and having colleagues that uh, I'm proud of. I, I was thinking, uh, somebody, I thought you were going to ask me, well, who are the biggest influences on your thing? Well, like besides Dan Koenig and a few professors, my role models were people like you, and they were all younger than me, and, and many of them were female, and uh, you know, we did a lot of this casually almost, uh, socializing and things, and that, that really, um, you know, I was proud to have all these people as my friends, and, and, and they, they uh, led me to uh, maybe do more. It wasn't consciously, but you figure, you know, they're doing it, and why don't I do it, you know? Yeah, and, and this is true. Uh, a, a few of the books you've done with uh, with Dave Simon and, and Pam mm. Tantanilato, mm. Uh, and these were relationships that started at conferences. That's exactly right, yeah. And uh, and so people think you're just going to party or something. You go to a, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's almost like a session. You get yeah. to know the people there, and, uh, and you're going to be writing something. Oh, I know. Like Pam, she knows something about that, or uh, Wanda Foglia, or some yeah. of these other people. I mean, they're, and they're all. I mean, none of them were had their noses up in the air. These are all people that yeah, you right could right. really uh, take pride in knowing. Yeah. Yeah, and and it is interesting because you know as, as your career you know really took off in the '80s, uh, you know back then there wasn't all this online stuff, you know, with, with ResearchGate and and all these other things where you yeah. could see what people are doing. You relied much more on the meetings. To find oh, out absolutely! What's coming out? Absolutely, you know, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. What folks are working on, uh, and uh, right, and it was all those offline conversations, mm -hmm. you know, at the bar or after sessions or whatever. Oh, yeah. That, uh, that, yeah. The, the that thing. reminds me. In the early days, I, I remember it was in San Antonio. It was one of the ACGS conference, and 
Uh, Peter Benicus was with me and, and kind enough to come to my session, and I think no one showed up. I mean, maybe <laughs> one other person showed up, and so we decided to uh, go to the bar uh, and call it a round table. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, some some re really good times, and uh, I I recall the times where uh, uh, we invited you up up to Niagara oh. as, as a guest speaker. <laughs> That's a scam. <laughs> they did invite us up there, and they put signs all over campus. Today, a distinguished professor, you know, and all this, and I think he gave us a hundred bucks, and yes, then they'd take you out to eat, and we had a good time. And then, like the next week, we would have the same thing over at Mercyhurst. <laughs> distinguished professor, and this and that. I, I do recall. Uh, speaking at the time on like white collar crime or mm -hmm. something and I said well I was originally asked to speak on organized crime but I thought why would I be speaking on organized Jay Albany is one of the big experts on organized crime and besides you have on your faculty Professor Harry Dammer who's from New Jersey <laughs> <It's> <laughs> right. Yeah. right so he's also lived organized crime <laughs> uh, uh, yeah it, it, yeah the, 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 those are all just mm -hmm. just uh, you know terrific things mm -hmm. and then there was a time uh, up in Niagara uh, we had an external review of our program. Oh yeah! And uh, you and George Cole from Connecticut were the external reviewers. And Larry Gaines too. And Larry Gaines yeah. also. Mm -hmm. And uh, took you up to the uh, Skyline Restaurant uh -huh. overlooking Niagara Falls. Nice. It's a rotating restaurant uh -huh. at the top of the thing, and it's a great restaurant. But at that time, I don't know if it's still true. Uh, everything moved, you know, slowly, so you could see the view. Uh, but if you put your drink on the far uh, ledge, lose the it. drink would stay still, and you would. And have there was some guy down the other place drinking all our drinks. Yeah. <laughs> it's a ghost spot. <laughs> it was really kind of yeah. funny. I said, "Where the hell is my drink?" You know, <laughs> it's rotating backwards. You know, yeah, uh, yeah fascinating. Stuff. That was very nice. I very nice. enjoyed that. I, I still go to the one restaurant in Lewiston, or is it? Yeah, Lewiston. Down, mm -hmm. down on the river. Oh, oh yeah, it's yeah. beautiful. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, great, great. Uh, uh, view and uh, so now tell me now now not now that you're professor emeritus at Mercyhurst mm -hmm. uh, did you plan to do more writing or what what is your feeling well I'm, I'm, I'm doing uh, finishing the criminology book again another I did you know and, uh, and uh, I was just downstairs uh, Gary Bauer with uh, with uh, Pearson Pearson and he's saying I don't know something's going on with on on edit online and this and that mm -hmm. Um, you may have to move up. I think the book just came out again. You know, I think that it's a whole different change in publishing now with with everything that they're doing. You yeah. can't keep track of it all. You know? Right. And but that's those are the projects that I think I'm most likely to be involved with. Right. And it's a fair point because now the publishers are because uh, uh, there isn't anybody uh, reading books anymore. Mm -hmm. They're creating new content for students. Sure. So yeah. All this hybrid electronic stuff and. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Trying to, you know, well, you can even see these before. these uh, online projects that you guys are doing, interview, oral history projects, everything would be so. I mean, already they're already there, but it's almost like, well, click on this and, and no, it'll be almost like jumping out at you, yeah, out yeah. pages or something. You two will be like little models of whatever, yeah. <laughs> emojis or something. Yeah, emoji, maybe, yeah, that, <laughs> that would be the aspiration. <laughs> uh, Oh, that's that, that that's terrific, Frank. Uh, <laughs> uh, are, are, are there other things that that uh, we we should uh, uh, talk about while, while I have you here? Uh, because you were part of you know one of the original wave of criminologists that helped form the field. Because criminal justice was just emerging mm -hmm. as a discipline as, as your career was was taking off, um, and that resulted in, in a window that you exploited very successfully to say, well, this is what research methods. And criminology and criminal justice ought to look like uh, in your book, and this is what a criminology, uh, you know, a, a crim theory kind of book should look should include. Because mm -hmm. back then it was a much bigger deal, because you were helping define well what should be in a standard mm -hmm. text, uh, and back then that had not not really been settled yet. Mm -hmm. uh, where whereas now, of course, it is. But um, so in that sense, you almost help to define, you know, what the scope is. If you're yeah. going to have a curriculum, what should the scope of methods be? Mm -hmm. What should the scope of, of CRIM be? Mm -hmm. And uh, and that, that th those are very interesting times. Because, you know, as you know, criminology was separating from SOCH, and, yeah. and uh, it was a, to just a, a very interesting time mm -hmm. to, to be writing, uh, to be writing. Uh, well, okay, Frank, if you don't okay. have anything else. Well, you know, I, I am running for off, no. <laughs> <laughs>
There's some guy named Trump they're trying to get rid of. Man. Yeah. <laughs> no. Well, thank you very much, all Frank. Right, I appreciate you, you coming appreciate by. Appreciate your comments. And, and uh, thank you all for joining us for the oral history of criminology. Thank, thank you. you. I'd like to thank Brendan. I saw, um, uh, what's it called, going up to his room to get a corkscrew. He said, okay. Well, right, when I said, anybody here have a corkscrew, two people stand up. <laughs> I said, how do these people walk around with corkscrews? And what the hell Before is Before the other meeting, you could either get a bottle of wine or a book. And he says, who's going to go grab the bottle of wine? Everybody would think you're an alcoholic, you know. <laughs> you could look like you're Right, and of course, the, the, that was the wine they had last night. Uh -huh. yeah. But yeah, it's hard to explain to your colleagues. <laughs> you had a choice of 10 books or a bottle of wine. I took the wine. Uh, if I want to read, I'll read the wine label. And I'll go to the library. <laughs> All right, you two are ready to rock and roll here. Ready? Right? So, okay. Yeah. Yep.